So for this <clears throat> overarching set of lectures, we will be talking about social perception, and specifically for this first part, we will be talking about nonverbal communication. Social perception refers to the study of how we form impressions of and make inferences about other people, just as a definition to get started. Moving on into nonverbal communication, this refers to the way in which people communicate without words. And this communication can be intentional. We can adopt certain body postures, for example, to convey certain emotionality, or it could be unintentional, where you make a certain facial expression without meaning to, and it gives away certain intentions or feelings you would have rather kept private. The most common modalities for nonverbal communication include facial expressions, tone of voice, gestures, body position and movement, the use of touch, and the use of eye gaze. Now, this form of communication is incredibly helpful when it comes to communicating our emotions and attitudes along with our personality, and they let us do the same about other people. And when this mode of communication is removed, it actually makes miscommunication all the much more common, which is something many of us are now familiar with using text as a modality through either messages or emails, where oftentimes one can say something well-meaning enough and it is completely misinterpreted. And oftentimes one is very surprised by how it is misinterpreted, thinking to yourself, I would have presumed that was perfectly clear. And one of the primary reasons why this type of misconception is exacerbated in these mediums is because there is no nonverbal communication. Some people say that's why emojis and emoticons were created. And perhaps as people become more familiar with them, they'll have more common usage. But personally speaking, half the time when I see them, I don't understand what they mean. And we've had eons to figure out the basic nuances of nonverbal communication. Some more definitions. So when we're referring to the generation of any kind of nonverbal communication in any of its forms, we use the term encoding. I'm encoding some type of communication through my body or my eyes or my face. The opposite, when we are interpreting any kind of nonverbal behavior or communication, is termed decoding. This is just like sending encrypted messages. You encode a secret message, it gets transmitted, and then the person to whom it's meant to go then decrypts that message or decodes it. One of the most common places where we see nonverbal communication happen is through facial expressions. Our faces are probably some of the most expressive parts of our entire body, maybe with the exception of our hands. And not everybody talks as much as, well, some people with their hands, like me. Um, but that's, you probably will never actually see that, so it's not important. Okay. This is perhaps one of the most dominant forms as well, and it is one of the only nonverbal communication modalities in which we have something that we call universal expressions. And these include the facial expressions for fear, anger, disgust, surprise, sadness, and happiness. And I'm going to show you some faces on the next slide. You can find them in your textbook as well. And the likelihood is you will have no problems whatsoever identifying which face is representing which feeling. Now, here are those faces. You can take a minute to just look through them. Now, we will talk about differences in perception of this, but for the most part, people can recognize these six facial expressions no matter where they are. Further, you can ask people about certain scenarios that are appropriate to these expressions and ask them to make the expressions that would go with it, and people will also, without trouble, make these facial expressions. What lends even more evidence to the universality of these expressions is even people who are born blind will oftentimes make these expressions when they're experiencing the emotions that go with them. So remember, anger, surprise, disgust, fear, happiness, and sadness are the six, and you can sort them to which ones you want. There is a key upside down in your textbook if you need. So these are considered universal because as I mentioned previously, these can be recognized pretty much across the world, even in pre-literate cultures or cultures that have 
almost no contact with the outside world at large. Now, Darwin, way back when, argued that these expressions are remnants or vestiges of once useful physiological expressions. What this means is that they conferred some type of survival advantage, and while they might not anymore, hence the vestiges of, they are still retained because it takes a long time for evolution to ultimately completely erase something. Now, some research has been done on this with specific faces. I believe the authors are Suskin et al., which you can look into if you'd like, because it's actually quite a cool study. And they showed that one, fearful and disgust faces are complete opposites of each other in terms of facial muscles. So if you were to take all the places where your face is contracting in a disgust face and reverse those muscles such that they expanded, you would ultimately end up with a fear face. And what they've argued is that there is some physiological basis, such that when you tend to make a fearful face, you open up your eyes quite wide, so too do your nostrils open, and oftentimes your mouth as well. And they believe that this could be because we are increasing the amount of sensory input that comes into our system. So when one is afraid, one is often afraid of some type of target, and we're generally going to try and find that target Hence, it makes sense for us to increase our sensory input. Of course, that matters much less in this modern world, where things we tend to be afraid of are not often tangible and directly in front of us. They're much more complicated than, say, running away from a lion and trying to figure out where that lion is going to come from. Disgust faces are opposite in this regard. They tend to scrunch up the eyes and the nose, and this is thought to reduce the amount of stimulus coming in to your sensory organs, along with protecting them in case you are exposed to some kind of dangerous contaminant. Now, while that fits quite well for fear and disgust, it is not quite so clear, for example, what evolutionary benefit a happy face or an angry face would confer. Now, one could make the argument that one need not go to such a basic physiological explanation. It could be that because we as human beings are social animals and we who have come from the apes, which probably came from monkeys, and over the last 10 odd million years, chances are most of those beings have all been social creatures as well. And one need not only look at the apes in the sort of evolutionary tree, you find social animals in almost all walks and swims of life. And being able to effectively communicate internal states is highly advantaged to or long-term survival because a group that hunts and lives together oftentimes will survive better than many of those individuals especially if you are no longer required to devote as many resources to high levels of defense or attack. So it could well be that our expressions and their universality is just a vestige of the fact that we are social creatures and social creatures have learned to demonstrate nonverbal behavior in this way. It isn't, however, as clear cut as one will oftentimes hear with these six primary or universal expressions. Now, there are some differences between cultures. For example, people from Western cultures will tend to identify those six faces and have very rigid boundaries between those six faces. Whereas Eastern cultures will also be able to identify those six faces, but oftentimes they have a greater degree of overlap between the categories. Also, it is not well, it doesn't quite translate everywhere. So they have found that there is a pre tribe called the Himba people, and they live in Namibia. And they actually, when asked to sort faces according to whatever their own metrics are, will sort in a slightly different way than this conventional six organization. And not to say that they can't sort them into these six categories if you ask them to, they'll do that just fine. But if you are asking them to just freely sort, Instead of simply labeling them as emotions, they will oftentimes express that these people are in the midst of some type of action instead of their feeling. Now, there are also a whole gamut of other emotions that are much less clear. Emotions like contempt, shame, anxiety, determination, envy, embarrassment, and pride. These are all things that we can oftentimes recognize, but they're much less clear cut than, say, an angry or a happy face. 
And a lot of that is thought to do with just the fact that many of these involve some type of body gestures as well as certain specific types of facial expressions. And this just adds to the complexity of trying to interpret these emotions. And so far, we've only talked about these just being singletons or single emotions represented on the face. And a lot of times the world itself is not so simple and we have complex series of emotions that either are taking place simultaneously or our faces are rapidly switching from one to the next and then onwards and onwards. Whenever you have more than one emotion represented on the face, this is referred to as affect blends. And this Basically, as the definition shows, one part of your face is showing one type of feeling and another type or another part of your face is showing a different feeling or emotion. And here are two examples of this. You can look at this man and the woman and make a guess at least as to what they're feeling. Now, again, you can look this up if you want. The man, at least from my guess, is probably experiencing a combination of disgust and anger, which could go well together. You know, you're seeing someone that you dislike and they've done something that you think is vile, easy to have anger and disgust, whereas the woman is likely experiencing a combination of happiness and surprise, which also could fit easily together, where an extra one of your loved ones shows up by surprise to your birthday party. And it gets even more complicated. So the context in which we are makes a huge difference on how well we can interpret or decode facial expressions. So first of all, just for a silly example, if someone is looking completely away from you and all you can see is the back of their head, you will have a near impossible time trying to decode their expressions. It does turn out that there are different ways in which this applies to the different emotions. It has been shown that anger expressions are easier to recognize or decode when someone is looking directly at you than when they are looking somewhere else. This is thought to be because it is more advantageous to recognize anger when it is directed to you because you could potentially be at harm's way. One sees the opposite pattern for fear expressions where these are actually easy to recognize when the person is not looking directly at you and rather is looking somewhere else. This is thought to be the case because oftentimes in a group of people when one is afraid by looking at where the object of their fear is, they can signal to the rest of their tribe where that thing is that they too should be afraid of. And since it is rare that they're looking directly at someone, even though you could be afraid of another human, it's very common because we get into all kinds of unfortunate shenanigans. It has been shown though that it is easier for us to recognize them when that face is not looking directly at us. And to just keep adding to this, there are what we call display rules, which are how different cultures and societies describe or proscribe what is an appropriate display of a certain type of emotion. And these vary quite widely actually across different cultures. So for example, here in the United States, it is generally not accepted, even though this is slightly changing, but still, for a man to show emotional displays in public. For example, if a man is just weeping on the train, mm, you will have all kinds of internal judgments about that person most likely. Whereas this is oftentimes considered more appropriate for a woman, even though we will again have all kinds of internal thoughts about that woman, but it is less shocking to us. Now, I've mentioned this before, but everybody has feelings and everybody can cry, right? Just because we have associated this with gender-based things for probably centuries now, doesn't mean that that's appropriate going forward, right? Everybody has feelings and everybody should be allowed to express them. That doesn't mean you have free range to just be a dick to other people, but also that you shouldn't just curtail someone's feelings because of the type of genitalia they may have. Just adding to that, here in this country, it is often okay or encouraged for women to smile and have wide smiles and to do so a lot. Whereas in Japan, for example, that is actually not the case, where large smiles are discouraged and they will oftentimes cover their mouth if they have a large and uncontrollable smile. Now, just adding, I guess, to life lessons, while this is true for everyone, it's probably more for the men, 
please don't tell random women, you know, that you, that they would look better if they smiled. This is inappropriate. It ultimately borders on harassment, if not being harassment. And there are far better pickup lines if you would like to talk to someone. How about, hello, my name is so-and-so, and it would be great to chat a little while so we can get to know each other. I mean, why does one have to be so weird about it and come up with extra special ways to engage communication? You could just say, hello, we have a prescribed way of doing it, right? It also totally disregards who they are and the context in which they're in. What if someone has a loved one who just passed away and you're that dick who walks up to them and is like, hey, why don't you just smile more right after they've gotten the phone call? People have all kinds of lives that we're not aware of. And, you know, being careful about those things is probably a good idea. Moving on to gestures. Here we have something that are called emblems, and these are nonverbal gestures that are ultimately very well understood within a given culture and usually have very direct verbal translations. So this would be like showing someone the finger, which translates directly to fuck you, excuse me. Now, it is very important to remember that this is very specific to a given culture, right? It can be very differently interpreted in different cultures. So some examples of this are the OK sign that people are familiar with. If you touch your pointer finger and your thumb together to make a loop and your other fingers are extended and you show it to somebody else, it's kind of like, OK, that does not mean OK everywhere. In Japan, for example, it means money. It means zero in France. It means sex in Mexico and it means homosexuality in Ethiopia. Right. Something so simple can be so confusing. Even more, the thumbs up sign, which is something I actually like showing here, especially even though people say that you can't send this emoji to people because it's passive aggressive, but that just seems strange to me because why would you need an emoji to be passive aggressive? But I don't send that many text messages, so I'm probably out of the loop there. Anyhow, that same thumbs up means excellent in France, which is kind of close, I guess. It means boyfriend in Japan, and in Iran and Afghanistan and certain other places of actually, let's say, Greece and Italy, it directly translates to sit on this, which I will let you use your imaginations and just say that it is not a good thing. Some more miscommunications, I guess, that could happen with nonverbal communication. One of the most intriguing that people are oftentimes surprised to find out is head nodding. And in many parts of the world, it does mean yes, if you nod your head up and down, but not everywhere. There are certain parts of Africa and India where nodding your head up and down actually means no, which is pretty strange. Um, Bulgaria is similar, even though in Bulgaria, oftentimes it is not as many times up and down. To add to this, if you ever find yourself in Korea and you shake your head, you're not actually saying no, you're just saying, I don't know, right? Or if a Korean is shaking their head at you, it doesn't necessarily mean no, it's just, I don't know, which are two different things. Eye contact and gaze is also quite different depending on where you find yourself. So here, eye contact is considered acceptable, even though personally, I find that people don't actually make that much eye contact here, but that could be from where I grew up and my bias of gaze. Places like Nigeria or Thailand, it is actually disrespectful for a younger person to look into the eyes of an elder, whereas it's okay if the elder looks into the eyes of the younger. And in some Arab countries, what we would consider staring here is fairly common. I mean, sometimes it looks like they're staring straight into your soul you believe in such things, but it varies quite tremendously. Another one that for me personally has had some interesting, funny situations is personal space. So people have different ideas of what is an appropriate social distance to have between two or more people. And not only does culture define this, but people have, or research has found that people in rural areas tend to like more space between them than people who live in urban centers. Now, personally, it didn't even occur to me that this was a thing until one time I was standing with a friend and we were just chatting about some stuff and another one of our friends came up to us and we're like, why are you chasing them all around the room? And it 
didn't occur to me at first what they were talking about, but then we realized that we were in a completely different part of the room. And ultimately what ended up happening was this other person kept from here, kept trying to maintain a little bit more distance between them and I, whereas I kept trying to close the distance a little bit more because it felt too far away for a frank discussion. And so ultimately what kept happening is just they would move a little way, I would move a little closer, they would move a little way, I would move a little closer, and we basically did this very slow shuffle dance all the way around the room. It's more fun when I can demonstrate this in person, but you'll just have to use your imaginations.